Well, good morning, church. Good to be together this morning uh, to worship the Lord together, to sing, to hear the word of God preached, to pray together, to take uh, communion together uh, in a few moments. Uh, we're going to sing uh, this morning about what Christ has done and who he is. Uh, and we're going to start off by declaring uh, that he has given us uh, every good blessing. And uh, so I want to read a call to worship uh, that points us in this direction that talks about how God has blessed us uh, and then goes into um, some detail about what those blessings are. So would you stand uh, as I read uh, Ephesians chapter 1. One of my favorite chapters in all of scripture, Ephesians 1, uh, starting in verse 3, it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Let's sing together. i 
to save us rose that we would be free regularly sing songs of the gospel uh, like that one. It was finished upon the cross and uh, in Christ alone. And communion uh, is a time for the church of Christ to identify precisely why our hope is in Christ and in him alone. Our hope is in Christ alone because Romans 3.23 is true. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 is also true. The wages of sin is death. We almost exclusively talk about wages in in terms of payment for a job. And before salvation, we treated sin as if it was our job. Our payment for being so good at our job of sin is death. Thankfully, Romans 6.23 goes on to say, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Our hope is in Christ alone because he alone is sinless. He alone has not fallen short of the glory of God. He alone stood in our place taking on death the wage we earned for our sin. And so we've come to this point of communion to declare once again that our hope is in Christ and in him alone. Jesus gave communion to the church, to all who are believers in and followers of Jesus Christ, and it's only for those who are believers in and followers of Jesus Christ. So if you're not a believer in and follower of Jesus Christ, we just ask that you not take uh, the bread uh, and the cup today, but uh, just uh, set it aside uh, in your chair there and watch uh, the church, the body of Christ, uh, remember his sacrifice. So go ahead and hold this piece of bread, uh, which symbolizes the body of Jesus in your hand. Just peel back that, that top little layer on the cup. And as you hold this bread, listen to these words again that we just sang. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones, you and me, he came to save Till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, The Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take together.
you pray with me? Father, we thank you for uh, the body of Jesus that was broken in our place as payment for our sin. We thank you that we now have a firm hope because of what Christ has done. We don't deserve this hope, and we would not have it if Christ had not come in his grace and mercy as the helpless babe who grew into the sinless man to die in our place. We, may we remember Christ today with great humility, reverence, thanksgiving, joy, and we pray this in his name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We remember next the, the blood of Jesus shed for us, and we sang in our first song this morning that Jesus sought me when a stranger. He went searching for us when we were strangers of his. And really, uh, the Bible teaches us that we weren't only strangers, we were his enemies. We were wandering from his fold. That's a, a sheep term, right? The, the sheep fold. The, the image here is um, of a sheep, us, <laughs> choosing to leave the safety of the fold and the shepherd lovingly and patiently and thoroughly searching for us to bring us back to safety. We sang, he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood. That word interpose, it's a, a big word that we don't use in our everyday conversations, but it's a great word. Interpose means to, to stand in between two things. You know, we, we hear stories all the time of, of people in harm's way being protected and saved because someone jumped in between them and the harmful person or the, the harmful object, and they took that harm on themselves. And so when we sing that, that Jesus interposed his precious blood, we're singing that Jesus used his own blood to stand in between us and the harm, by the way, the harm that, that we deserved, right? The harm of sin, death. He stood in between us and death and died himself by shedding his blood. And so we remember this uh, by taking the cup together. Paul again, 1 Corinthians 11, in the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Let's take together. Let's pray once again. Father, it, it is astonishing to consider your unconditional love that sought us when we were your strangers, your enemies. It's incredible to think on your amazing grace that rescued us from danger. And it's overwhelming to consider your sacrificial mercy that interposed your precious blood that stood in between us and the death we deserved. Help us, Lord. Help us to never, never take what you have done in saving us for granted. Keep us from apathy, uh, entitlement, complacency. May the love, grace, and mercy of Christ we just remembered be the foundation and, and really the, the catalyst for our worship, for our fellowship, our, our discipleship, our evangelism. We thank you for the opportunity we have this morning to remember together. And we also thank you for opportunities those within our church family have or, or recently have had to share the gospel with others across the globe. We thank you for John's opportunity to do this in Nepal with the McKinney's over the last couple of weeks. We thank you for Darren right now having the opportunity to share with brothers and sisters in Brazil. And we thank you, Lord, for Spencer being able to share the gospel with those in Alabama this morning. We pray for our brother Wayne, who will be sharing with us uh, in a few moments. God, I'm so grateful for him, and I just ask that you would use him mightily to point us to Jesus and the gospel once again. 
We pray this in the name of our shepherd and savior, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Last week, we had uh, the privilege of hearing the, the choir and orchestra sing uh, and play to lead us in worship. And uh, they introduced us to a new song that's fitting for us to sing right after communion. We just remembered uh, the death and the sacrifice of Jesus. And now we get to uh, joyfully proclaim that he is alive. Uh, he has risen. And so uh, we'll sing this uh, through. We'll sing the first verse uh, probably twice. So if you want to uh, remind yourselves of it, of how it goes, uh, just listen the first time. If you know it, feel free to sing along, but we'll sing that first verse twice and then the rest of the song. So would you stand as we sing together? Rise my soul, the Lord is risen. Rise my soul, the Lord is risen.
is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can see.
trust in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Well, good morning, church family. I'm not Spencer DeBerg. (laughs) My name is Wayne. I'm one of the associate pastors here, and it's my joy to open up God's word with you this morning. Uh, If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, please turn to John chapter 10. And we're going to be looking at one of the most beautiful passages of all of Scripture. And a few weeks ago, when the other four pastors decided who would preach, uh, They decided it would be either Brennan, but he had music to do. Then they thought, well, Dan is awesome at communicating, but he uh, has youth group to run. And so they said, well, Darren, for sure. And Darren's out of the country. So you get me. Uh, (laughs) Nonetheless, I'm still excited to be here. Uh, I asked the Lord, and this is true, I asked the Lord, Lord, what would I share with your people? Not what I want to talk about, but what do our people need to hear? And uh, if I can just take a moment before we begin, it seems like the waters are really stirred up and people everywhere I turn are just unsettled. And I don't think it's so much because Spencer's leaving in a couple weeks. I think it's more this election coming up in 48 hours. And everywhere I turn, people are kind of getting goofy. And people are kind of off, Christians, non-Christians. And it just seems like everyone, I don't know, this was just kind of humorous. Everyone seems to have an opinion of who they're going to vote for. And for whatever reason, they feel like they need to tell that to me. And then convince me I need to vote for her or vote for him. And uh, I'll just share with you two responses. These are actual responses I got this week. And let me put on my glasses to make sure I get it correct. Uh, Someone who I know, uh, I'm in a relationship who is riding on the back of the elephant, who is a Republican, said, these are are their words, if she gets in, welcome to World War III. (laughs) It's like, ooh. And then a little bit later, I was talking to someone who's riding on the back of the donkey, a Democrat, and they said, and these are their words, if that man gets in, welcome to hell on earth for the next four years. I thought, man, I don't like World War III and I don't like hell on earth for four years. And I had to say to myself, time out, time out. There's got to be a number three option. I don't like either of those options. And the Lord reminded me, and I want to remind you, brothers and sisters, Jesus Christ is Lord. Don't forget that he's in charge. And actually, when he left... Remember what he said? Hey, 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 guys, I know it's looking really dark. He told the disciples in Matthew 28, but all authority in heaven and earth, it's been given to me. All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. It isn't given to whoever we elect on Tuesday. It's been given to Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ is Lord. And uh, uh, I read this in Scripture, 172 times in Scripture, there's a verse that says, the Lord tells us, remember, 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 remember. And I thought, why are there 172 different verses in Scripture that tell us to remember? And I thought, man, we as sheep, we go astray. And we forget that Jesus Christ is Lord. And we start to think that things going on here on earth are super important and we forget about Jesus. And uh, I don't know, just one of my favorite remembers of Scripture is 2 Timothy 2.8 that says, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. This is Paul writing to Timothy right before he leaves this earth. He's like, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead. So brothers and sisters, today I proclaim to you uh, the title of our message, I'm still here. And that's not me, I'm still here. Jesus is telling every person here in this room today, I'm still here. I'm still in control. And whether you think so or not, it's going great. It is going great. I know your perspective, you think it's not going so great. The disciples thought the same thing when I was going to the cross. They thought it's not going so great. Trust me. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. 
Well, that is a pre, uh, pre uh, precursor to one of what we're going to look at. In your bulletin, you can see I wrote down uh, where we're going today. Jesus knows and gathers his own, the first six verses, then 7 through 10 of John 10. Jesus uh, protects and sustains his own. And then finally, verse 11, Jesus dies for his own. So John 10 is a continuation of John 9. And one thing that we are good at here at this church is getting things in context. So the context of John 10 is what's happened in John 9. So a lot of you aren't in the same ABF I go to, and I have the privilege every Sunday to hear Paul Anderson, a friend of mine, he reads the passage of Scripture before we uh, dissect it. So I've asked Paul to read John chapter 9 for us. Now, it's going to take a couple extra minutes to hear this whole passage, but I really, this isn't trying to be humble. I think this is going to be the best part of the sermon, hearing God's word proclaimed uh, with authority. So if you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 9, and that's going to set the context for what we're going to look at this morning. Paul? So as Wayne said, John chapter 9, beginning with the first verse, as he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to him, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight. And he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. But how he now sees, we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, he was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him saying, you are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, you were born in utter sin, and would you teach us? And they cast him out. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? 
Jesus said to him, you have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I come into this world that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no guilt, but now that you see, we see your guilt remains. Thanks, brother. Now with that as the backdrop, we pick up in John chapter 10, Jesus is still speaking to these same uh, crowd. He's addressing the Pharisees. He's addressing the blind man he had just healed. He's addressing his disciples who are gathered and others who are gathered there. And in John 10, he continues talking. And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. And Jesus is telling these men, you Jewish religious leaders, you Pharisees, you're like thieves and robbers. You claim authority, but you don't love or care for the sheep. And I thought about this, how you gain entry into the sheepfold tells us who you really are. And it's a timeless truth today for ministers of the gospel. Those have to come in through the sheepfold like every other person. And Jesus continues, verse 2, but he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Jesus is saying there's an authorized, appointed way in biblical times for a shepherd to shepherd his sheep, and he had to enter through a door. In verse 3, we continue, to him the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So Let's look at verse three for a second together and have a little Bible study. To him, the gatekeeper opens. Now in biblical times, in a village or a town, there was a common public sheepfold. It's kind of not what that picture looks like. That's more a country sheepfold. What Jesus is talking about, verse three, is in the towns, the shepherd would have, all different shepherds would have their sheep grazing. And then it was nighttime, they'd come into their town where they lived and there'd be a public place where they put their uh, 15 or 20 or however many sheep in the pen with other other shepherd's sheep and all the sheep were in this pen together and the gatekeeper would be paid to keep watch of it overnight as the shepherds uh, slept in their homes. So this is what Jesus is telling in the story and these people would understand what he's saying. He said to him, the gatekeeper opens, the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name. And I just thought he's trying to tell these guys, do you guys understand where I'm going with this? The sheep the sheep hear his voice, verse 3, and he calls his own sheep by name. Here Jesus is telling these Pharisees, uh, I'm calling my own sheep out of the crowd of sheep to my own. Yeah, I called this man out of the temple where he was begging, and now this man is with me. But the sweetest part of this verse, I think, is he calls his own sheep. He says they're mine, but he calls them by name. And I thought it doesn't say in Scripture, but that blind man had a name, and Jesus knew his name. I don't think the Pharisees probably knew who the blind guy was. He's just a blind man that's begging. But Jesus knew him by name, so we'll just give him the name Clyde. And I thought Clyde was standing here with Jesus in front of these scary religious leaders, and Jesus is saying, he's with me now. I know my own sheep by name. And in the Bible, some of the uh, sweetest uh, verses are, do you remember when Jesus first called Peter? He said, Simon, son of John. He knew Simon's name. He even knew his lineage. And then he gave him a new name. He called your name is Cephas, which is translated Peter. And then in the next chapter, Lazarus is going to get called out by name as well, out of the tomb, no less. And Jesus knows his sheep by name. And probably my sweetest favorite one was, do you remember after the resurrection when Mary was at the tomb and she didn't know what was going on? And remember what Jesus said? Mary, my sheep... I know my sheep by their name. And I thought as great as all those biblical illustrations are, I remember when Jesus first revealed to me that he knew me by name. And I wasn't in a good spot. I was 29 years old and living very immorally. I was on the broad road and I didn't hear his voice audibly, but I heard him speak in my heart, Wayne, you're mine and we're not going to do this anymore. You're coming with me. So the question I ask you, have you heard him call you by name? And what does he call him? 
at the end of it, it says he calls his own sheep by name and it says he leads them out. And uh, here in this illustration Jesus is using, he let out the excommunicated Clyde, the formerly blind man. He led him out of that false religious system into a relationship with himself. He's previously let out fishermen and he led them out. He's let out a tax collector. He's let out an immoral woman. (laughs) And today he's leading people out of godly homes, good Christian homes. He's leading some out into a relationship with himself. He's leading some out of ungodly homes into a relationship with himself. He's leading some out of super strict religious homes out of that into a relationship with himself. He's leading people out of, they don't have any family. I've met people at our church that don't have a family and we become the family. And Jesus says, I lead them out. So my question is, has he led you out? Has he called you? Has he called you by name and has he led you out into a relationship with him? Well, verse four, Jesus continues talking and he says, when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them. Like a good shepherd, I'm going before my sheep and they're gonna follow me. Jesus goes before us and it says this, and I love this, the sheep follow him. I'm like, why in the world would a sheep follow a shepherd? And the answer is the end of Jesus' verse four. Why? For they know his voice, they know his voice. And uh, sheep know the voice of a shepherd. And it kind of gets lost in our time because we don't have any shepherds floating around. And the people that do raise sheep, they just have a dog that kind of barks and gets them all to where they need to go. But in biblical times, they had a man or sometimes a woman called a shepherdess, and they would call the sheep. And the sheep knew them by name. So the original hearers would be like, I know exactly what Jesus is talking about. I've seen this done numerous times. My uncle is a shepherd. My next door neighbor sometimes tends sheep. And I've seen that the sheep, well, what did Jesus say? The sheep follow him for they know his voice. And I thought, have you ever heard the phrase, a picture is worth a thousand words? Sometimes a video could be worth 10,000 words. So uh, Eric, would you show this short video of a shepherd in biblical times and what that would have looked like to the people who were listening to Jesus? Can you see what Jesus is talking about? Well, I'm, I'm like most of the grade schoolers and middle schoolers in here. I need videos to see exactly what Jesus is talking about. That's our good shepherd. And a couple of things I noticed in that video, some of us need to come out of the fog. We've just been in a fog and we've been looking everywhere but to our good shepherd. So today, come to Jesus. If you're hearing his voice, he's calling you to come to him. Uh, I also thought that it was interesting Uh, None of those sheep looked very attractive, and so often we think it's all about us. It's not about us. We're just dumb sheep, like those sheep that came down the hillside. And finally, I thought, I have no clue what that shepherd was saying, (laughs) but he's not my shepherd. I do know when my shepherd's speaking to me, and I understand. I know his voice when he's calling me. So today Jesus is speaking to us in John chapter 10 and he continues speaking to these men and he uses that illustration in verse 4 and he goes on he says a stranger they will not follow but they will flee from him for they they do not know the voice of strangers 
This figure of speech Jesus used with them, so sad, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. And so this crowd, the disciples, uh, extra people, the religious leaders, the Pharisees that are all staying there, it says they did not understand what he was saying to them. And I thought, they're just like, man, I have no clue. Is he just talking about how to raise sheep? I don't really understand. I don't have a clue what he's talking about. And, uh, and then I just thought maybe some of the religious Pharisees, they were, whoa, 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 whoa. T- time out, time out. W- wait, wait, wait. Are you saying that I'm a sheep? Are you saying that I'm supposed to be a sheep? Do you know who I am? I'm Rabbi Hamel. I've been a rabbi in this jurisdiction for 28 years, and you're saying that I got to be a sheep now? And throughout the centuries, people have had this similar response. They don't really get it because their heart is hard. They're like, I don't want to listen to this. I don't want to be considered a sheep. I want to do it my way. I don't want to listen to what a shepherd tells me to do. And they don't, you don't hear his voice. So I ask you today, what camp are you in? Do you hear his voice? Do you hear him calling you to himself? Well, like I said in verse 6, they did not understand what he was saying to them. And I thought, if that was me, and I just spent all this time trying to explain what's going on with the healing of this blind man, a miraculous event where uh, all they want to know is, how do you do it? How do you do it? How do you do it? And the, answer, the question isn't, how did I do it? It's like, who did it? Come to me. Come to me. You don't need to understand everything. You just need to come to me. You're a sheep, and I want to be your shepherd. Well, that's not our Jesus. Verse 7, it says, Jesus again said to them, I just wrote down, what grace, what grace to explain to the people again. I think his heart wasn't to slam dunk these people. I think his heart was to win them to himself. So it says, Jesus is again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Now, unlike in the public villages, there were country sheepfolds as well where there was no paid watchman and the shepherd would be off somewhere in the wilderness. And that's the picture we have here. And in those sheep pens, there would be drawn up, but you notice there's an entrance, but there's no door. And the original hearers would have understood this picture quite well as well. And Jesus said to them, guys, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. There's only an opening and there's only one door and I am that door. Why did he use that illustration? I think one of the reasons he used the illustration of a door is he made it as simple as possible because his goal was to win a soul. He wanted to win them and he wanted to make this as easy to understand as possible. And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door. It's a simple figure of speech. A child could understand a door and have... I think Jesus here is saying, I'm your only access to God, my Father. Remember John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, through the door. I'm also reminded in Acts 4, 12, when the disciples started preaching Peter's message, remember what he said? There's no other name, there's no other name under heaven given to men by what? by which we must be saved. Once again, Jesus is the door. He's the only way into his sheepfold. All other ways are sheeps and robbers. And he says, I am the door of the sheep. Verse 80 continues, all who came before me are thieves and robbers. You Pharisees, you leaders are harsh, legalistic. You don't love the sheep and you don't love my sheep. And all you guys who came before me are thieves and robbers. And that says this, but the sheep did not listen to them. And uh, it reminded me just this past week, uh, Darren and I went to go see a man who was in a hard spot. And we talked about uh, so many people that have come to our church in the past few years are coming out of some really difficult, hard church situations uh, where, I don't know, their leaders, their shepherds weren't really shepherding them very well. And I've talked to a lot of people that are coming out of authoritative, commanding, uh, rules-based religion, and they're coming hurt and wounded. And it's so interesting because Jesus is described as gentle and lowly and he's loving and kind and caring. And I wrote this down, his true shepherds, unlike the Pharisees, have entered through the door. So a true leader has had to enter through the door and that's super humbling. And you get broken and you get laid low and now you're able to be an under shepherd for the chief shepherd. And when you do that, when you go through the door, whether you're a minister or whether you're just a normal Christian, You're going to exhibit the fruits of his Holy Spirit that he gives you as you enter the door, which is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. 
I'll submit this to you. If you're looking for someone to shepherd, don't just look at their gifts. Look at their character. See what kind of man they are or see what kind of woman they are. Not just how gifted they are, but who they are. Have they gone through the door? If they have, they're going to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. Well, continue on in Jesus' talk. He says a second time to this group, he says, I am the door. He just said that, and he says it again, and I don't think Jesus had a stuttering problem, but I really think he was trying to get people to realize, I am the door. There's only one way to God, and it's through me. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And I want to stop right there before I finish verse 9. A memory that came to me is when I was first in seminary, I just became a Christian. We had an evangelism class. And the professor said, I want all you guys to be able to share your testimony, how Jesus saved you in five minutes or less. Because often when you go out and share, you don't have time to share the two hours of gory details of how he saved you out of some pickle. So guys would come up and you get it in five, five and a half minutes because we're all talkers. And then I remember there was one young lady. She was a foreign exchange student from China. So she had broken English. And she just walked up and her assignment was to tell how she got saved, her testimony in five minutes or less. And she just walked up and she got to the microphone and she said, I entered through the door. And then she walked down. I was like, that's the best testimony I've ever heard. That's 25 years ago. I still remember her testimony. I entered through the door. So brothers, sisters, non-brothers and sisters, have you entered through the door? All right, did you climb in some other way? So I thought, if Jesus says, I am the door, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved. It says that right here in verse 9. And I thought, I wrote down some ways, uh, alternatives to following Jesus' command to enter through the door. Uh, Jesus did not say, if anyone admires the door, he will be saved. Jesus did not say, if anyone listens to the door, he will be saved. Jesus did not say, if anyone praises the name of the door, he will be saved. Jesus did not say, if anyone intellectually believes in the door, oh, I believe in Jesus. If anyone intellectually believes in the door, he will be saved. Uh, this one I thought was amusing. If anyone defends the door against all false doors, he will be saved. I know a lot of people that do that. Uh, Jesus did not say, if anyone gets baptized in the name of the door, he will be saved. Jesus did not say, if anyone sits at the doorstep and enjoys the music and messages extolling the door, he will be saved. If anyone refutes the cardinal doctrines and errors people have of the door, they will be saved. He didn't say that. If anyone becomes a member of the church of the door, they will be saved. None of those things Jesus says here. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. So it begs the question, how do I enter by Jesus and be saved? It's really simple. Repent of trying to be a good person and repent of your sin. And turn and follow Jesus. You repent of sin and you put your faith in Jesus. Much like if you're on an airplane it was going down, you wouldn't believe in a parachute, you put on the parachute. And in a similar way, you repent of your sin and you put on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. And I just want to write this down. If you do that, you are instantaneously saved. I know there's some stuff going on and I hear people talk about, well, I'm kind of working on getting saved. It's like you don't work on getting saved. You repent and you trust Jesus. and It's an act of, your, uh, act of your will and Jesus will save you. Just as how long does it take? Instantaneously. Just as long as it takes me to walk through that door after service is how long it takes Jesus to save a sinner. Although I wrote this down, if you insist on bringing your goodness and all your righteous deeds, it might be a little more difficult. And I found that bringing your wood, wood hay, and straw uh, makes entrance through the door a little more cumbersome. So nothing in your hands you bring, simply to the cross you cling. Come just as you are to Jesus. Enter through the door, Jesus says, and you will be saved. And then he has these promises. You will go in and out. And as believers, we not only go in with Jesus and spend time with Jesus in word and prayer and praising him alone, we also go out 
and to witness and to build each other up and have fellowship and attend church together and worship him together. Uh, we're not in the fold the whole time. That would be kind of like a prison. We have freedom in Christ to come and go. Jesus said, you'll be saved with me and I'll let you go in and out. And I wrote this down, I wasn't going to share it, but so many times a Christian, I think, could be described to as a sponge. And you guys know these plastic sponges we have at home. Uh, if you soak it in a lot of water, it can be very, very helpful for washing dishes. But if you leave it on the side, it can be crusty. But the problem is if you soak a sponge in dishes, in dishwater, and you let it sit there after three or four days, it just starts to stink. And so many Christians I know just kind of spend their time just reading, 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 and they never get squeezed out into the world on other people. So my challenge to us is to go in with Jesus and then to go out and tell him, tell the rest of the world how beautiful he is. Go in and out. And if you don't go in with Jesus, you become one of these crusty sponges that can actually cut your hand if they sit long enough. No, Jesus wants us to go in and out, and then this is beautiful and fine pasture. You'll find what Jesus still waters lush green pasture, rest for your soul, peace and contentment. So the question I had for myself, and I spent time with him, Wayne, when's the last time you found pasture? And I ask you folks, when's the last time you found pasture with Jesus? We just spent time alone with him for no other reason, not to prepare, just to spend time with him. Jesus says, I am the door. Anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Jesus continues in John chapter 10, verse 10. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. You false religions are ultimately leading to death. And then probably one of the sweetest promises of Scripture. I came, Jesus says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now, I've known a lot of people who have had this life. I've known a lot of saved people, and I've known a lot of you here who are Christians who have entered the door. <sighs> Well, can I be straight with you? I don't know a lot of people who are living the abundant Christian life. I don't see a lot of us living abundantly. And I thought, what does abundant Christian life look like? Well, David wrote it in Psalm 23. He said, my cup overflows. I got so much Jesus. He's just pouring out on other people. I don't know a lot of us here. I know we all have different personalities, so it's going to be expressed differently. So I was getting a little bit discouraged. I'm like, man, do I know anybody that's lived this abundant Christian life? Uh, and I thought the abundant Christian life is also this. It may not be comfortable. It may not be long, but it's overflowing with joy and satisfaction in Jesus. And then I remembered someone. I remembered someone that lived the abundant Christian life. And this person didn't always know what was going on, but he had the abundant Christian life. Eric, would you put that last slide on the screen? Do you guys remember our brother? He went to heaven four months ago. <sighs> That's the abundant Christian life. Noah had it. Noah had the abundant Christian life. I wrote this down about Noah as we can look at his picture and we can keep it up there and look at him. Noah didn't always know what was going on when he was at the hospital, but he had the abundant Christian life in that hospital. Noah didn't always know what was going on when he was at school, but he had the abundant Christian life. Noah didn't always know what was going on when he was getting all those shots and had all those multiple surgeries. But if you knew him, you know he had the abundant Christian life. <sighs> I remember when they told Noah he couldn't eat food anymore. And for the last couple of years of his life, he couldn't eat. He didn't get it. He didn't know what was going on. But Noah had the abundant Christian life. That joy and excitement in Jesus was overflowing. I thought when he was in children's church all these years, <laughs> I talked to some of the leaders. They, didn't, they said, ah, he doesn't always know what's going on. But boy, that boy has the abundant Christian life. He had joy overflowing. A uh, couple others. Uh, do you guys remember when he was in choir? He kind of stood there. I remember talking to Brennan, and he's singing, and he's singing off key, and he didn't know when to stop singing. He didn't know what was going on, but he had the abundant Christian life. That brother of ours did. That what Jesus was in him and joy was coming out of him. I remember when he sat in big church, he couldn't always stay for the hour and a half because he didn't always know what was going on. But he had the abundant Christian life. I remember him being in youth group. Sometimes he was a little disruptive because he keeps shouting out, isn't Jesus amazing? But he had the abundant Christian life. Do you remember when he got baptized? And that's what this video is. Remember how exuberant he was in that tank? 
There's, I've been here for, I don't know, almost 20 years, and there's never been a standing ovation in this church. There was that day, and Noah was over the moon, and Noah had the abundant Christian life. He didn't really know a ton of what was going on in baptism. All he knew is he loved Jesus, and he was going to get baptized. Noah ex- exhibited and experienced the abundant Christian life. And then finally, I think all of us can remember the times when he's the best greeter this church has ever seen. Remember him sitting there? Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. People are like, whoa, it's 845. I didn't have coffee yet. He didn't care. He didn't care. That boy had the abundant Christian life. And Jesus wants to give every one of us the same abundant Christian life that Noah Solomon had. So I ask you today, are you experiencing the abundant Christian life? Jesus said, I came. Why'd you come, Jesus? He said, at the end of verse 10, I came that they might have life and to have it abundantly. Are you experiencing his abundant Christian life? Does your heart sing? Maybe he doesn't express it, but does your heart sing? Isn't Jesus amazing? You might not know what's going on. Heck, I don't know what's going on most of the time, but I want to have this relationship with Jesus that's abundant. I don't want to just kind of coast through life making a couple bucks. I want the abundant Christian life that Noah had. So I asked, do you have it? In our last verse, Jesus dies for the sheep. Jesus says in verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The best known and most beloved description of Jesus is I am the good shepherd. I'm both the door and the good shepherd. I'll give you life when you enter into me and I'll take care of you and protect you when you come into me. And Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And then he finishes this passage that we're gonna look at today. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And four more times, if you read John 10, four more times he emphasizes, I lay down my life for the sheep. I will lay down my life for my sheep. And he's foreshadowing dying on the cross. And I thought, wait a minute. If the shepherd dies for the sheep, the sheep are going to be scattered and the wolves and other predators will have a field day with us defenseless sheep. Yes, except one thing. Jesus, our good shepherd, didn't stay dead. That's got to be louder than that. Do another hallelujah, whoever that was. Yeah, exactly. Jesus didn't stay dead. I do not proclaim to you a dead savior. Jesus is alive, he's here today, and he wants to spend time with you. Jesus is our good shepherd, and he did not stay dead. He's alive, and he's also alive forevermore. I'm going to read to you, and hopefully this is your heart today, the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So my pastoral challenge as I close my time with you is this, a show of hands, how many of you will take 30 minutes today, not tomorrow, not Tuesday, not next, four, next Friday, today, how many of you will turn off your TV, put away your phone, and with an open Bible, spend 30 minutes with your good shepherd today? Just a show of hands. Will you spend 30 minutes with your shepherd today? Well, I'm going to pray for you, and then Brennan's going to sing over us. Let's pray. Lord, I love being in the fold. I love that you're, you're the door. And I love, Lord, that you're my good shepherd and you take care of your sheep. I thank you, Lord, that you know me by name. And I pray, Lord Jesus, for times of refreshing for my brothers and sisters whose hands raised just now. Lord, I pray that you would help them keep that commitment, whether the Packers win or lose, uh, whether uh, the food tastes bad or good at lunch, all that stuff, Lord, I pray would go by the wayside and they would, by faith, enter into a quiet time with you for a half hour today and just spend time with you. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would talk with them and you would remind them that you're still here. You got this thing totally under control. Whether uh, Kamala gets in or Donald gets in, uh, it really doesn't matter as long as Jesus Christ is Lord. So Lord Jesus, I pray for my brothers and sisters today. I pray, Lord, you would be a very good shepherd to them. And then they would come to you this afternoon 
and find rest for their soul. I love you, Lord, and I pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Are you weary, heavy laden? Come and lay your burdens down. Jesus calls you, Jesus draws you, rest in him. He is gentle, he is lowly, he delights to bring us peace. Tender shepherd, Mighty Savior, rest in Him. How sure His compassion for us. Oh, how deep is His love. So come, come to Jesus and rest in him are you hopeless are you guilty caught in shame for all your sin he pursues you to forgive you rest in him he has paid for every failure. Mercy flows in endless streams. Come and follow. Freedom calls you. Rest in Him. How sure his compassion for us. Oh, how deep is his love. So come, come to Jesus and rest in him. And are you waiting in your sorrows for this broken world to heal. He is coming, soon returning, rest in him. And we will see him, we will know him. Oh, what heights of grace revealed from his kindness, every promise then fulfilled. So trust in Jesus, he will keep us to the end. How sure his compassion for us. Oh, how deep is his love. So come, come to Jesus and rest. How sure his compassion for us. Oh, how deep is his love. So come, come to Jesus and rest in him. Come to Jesus and rest in If you'd stand, I'll close our time with a benediction. The Bible makes it abundantly clear, brothers and sisters, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Spend time with him today. He's waiting for you. Go in peace.
You're dismissed.